Good morning, everybody. Good morning, Somerville. And welcome to this panel on broadband uh, internet access in Somerville. And uh, my name is Rand Wilson. I'm with the Somerville Stands Together Coalition, which is made up of about 25 labor, community, and environmental organizations. And no surprise, we work on workers' rights, uh, uh, affordable housing, and environmental justice issues. Um, one of our uh, coalition members wanted to uh, begin to promote municipal broadband in Somerville. And emerging from that, Somerville Stands Together decided to host this forum on uh, municipal broadband. And I want to give a big shout out to Greg Hill and to the whole committee that put this program together with our panelists and a number of uh, respondents as well that you'll hear from this morning. Um, <clears throat> our uh, show will consist of uh, some brief presentations, and I will introduce the panelists shortly, uh, followed by some respondents uh, and Q&A from our audience. Um, our first speaker is Sean Gonzalez, who is from the community broadband team of the Institute for Local Self-Reliance, and he lives down on the Cape and is a active reporter, and I'll let him take it from here. Sean? Thank you, thank you. Um, yeah, so at, at the Institute for Local Self-Reliance, um, we are a leading research organization, and we track the birth and development of municipal broadband networks or community broadband networks generally across the country, and we're also pretty heavily involved in the broadband uh, policy space. But let's begin in the Hope neighborhood in Detroit. The pandemic has, has just turned everyone's lives upside down. Folks are having to do remote work. Kids are trying to do distance learning. And right at that moment, the Hope neighborhood experiences an internet outage served by AT&T. Comcast is also in the city, but this particular part of the city happens to have service of, of, through AT&T. Oh, the internet's only gonna be down for two days. Two days turned into two weeks, turned into four weeks, turned into six weeks. Sounds like the orange line. <laughs> and I start there because it, it, it's, it, it's illustrative of what, what happens in cities elsewhere very often. And it's because the patchwork of these privately owned networks, in many instances, the network has de been degraded over time. The monopoly provider doesn't want to put the money in to upgrade the network. Sometimes the service to particular parts of, uh, of a city or a community doesn't really exist, or maybe it's DSL, you know, inferior, uh, you know, technology or, or insufficient technology to really handle the kind of needs that, 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 that folks have. And so that's the type of thing that you see in cities across the country, and people are paying high prices, essentially, for second-rate service. Now, of course, if you've got money, you'll be able to get a good connection. It, it may be expensive, but if money's not an object, you know, sure, you'll, you'll, you'll be fine. Not so much for folks who may be struggling in neighborhoods like the Hope Village uh, or the Hope, the Hope neighborhood in Detroit, Hope Village neighborhood. A major reason why people in Detroit don't have home internet service, however, isn't so much about whether or not a network exists, it's, it's an issue of affordability. And as digital equity advocates like to say, if it's not affordable, it's not accessible. Congress essentially settled, that, has essentially settled on establishing, having established this American Connectivity Program, the ACP. And that is a program that offers a $30 a month subsidy for income eligible households to pay for internet subscription service. There's also a $100 one time subsidy for, uh, for devices. But like Josh Edmonds, who is Detroit's digital inclusion director, is fond of saying, we can't coupon our way out of this. And he's right, because while the ACP is a very important program, and it certainly is helping 
by our counts, somewhere on the on the order of about 13 million people, which, by the way, is only one out of the uh, out of the three households that are eligible to be enrolled in the program, is certainly useful um, and helpful to get people connected now where service exists. However, the reason why we've got this affordability crisis, the reason why we have these examples of these long internet outages, um, where we where we see community after community. Uh, where there isn't ubiquitous, reliable, affordable broadband is because the, the, of a failed market. We've, we, we, we live in a broadband market that is dominated by monopolies, these regional monopolies where I think somewhere on the order of 83 million Americans have a choice of one provider. And when you're the only ball game in town, there's not a lot of incentive to upgrade networks, to really care much about customer service, and certainly you're not competing for, uh, on, uh, on, or for customers in terms of prices and, 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 and so forth. So what are they doing in Detroit? So, so jo people like Josh and, and other city leaders there recognize that we can't coupon our way out of this. It's a temporary Band-Aid, a disintegrating Band-Aid, by the way, because the ACP, while it is theoretically a permanent program, Congress appropriated $14 billion. Now, we just... Uh, um, unveiled what we call the ACP dashboard that is a uh, predictive map that tells a visual story of how much is being spent the enrollment numbers state by state on down to the zip code level and it tracks right now the ACP at the current enrollment rates is going to run out of money beginning of 2025 there's a vigorous effort right now with the FCC and others to boost enrollment. If we got up to 50% enrollment, those funds run out somewhere in, say, November 2024, which in legislative terms is like next week. And so you can see that it's a temporary solution. So, so, so this is what Josh means about you, we can't coupon our way out of it. So what are they doing? So what is Detroit doing? They, well, they took the, the American Rescue Plan funds that they got, the city got directly, states have gotten portions as well, and they're building a open access fiber network, a targeted one, it's a pilot project to, in the west side of uh, Detroit, where Hope Village neighborhood is, and um, because they understand that, well, I should also explain real quickly, an open access network essentially is a, it's a publicly owned internet infrastructure, almost always fiber, and it's where it's owned by that municipality and it's leased to multiple private providers to come and it lowers the barrier for entry for ISPs and so what they do is can focus on providing the retail service and it creates an environment and an ecosystem that invites competition which of course is beneficial for uh, subscribers and folk and residents in that area. That's a more long long-term solution. Um, uh, I'm not sure exactly the, 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 um, the timeline for construction there, but they've already begun building that network. Um, municipal broadband is, as many of you are aware, are locally controlled, publicly owned broadband networks. There are over 900 of those in the United States operating now with hundreds of other communities in various planning stages of either seriously considering or actually getting ready to build. Um, you know, there's this idea out there that municipal broadband is too difficult. Like the, the, the big telecoms like to say that municipal broadband is too difficult, too complicated, it's too expensive. Cities and municipalities do infrastructure projects all the time. And in terms of cost, certainly I don't want to make it sound as if, for example, fiber networks, which are called future-proof for a reason because they tend to last for about 50 years, more expensive to build on the front end but cheaper to maintain over the long haul. Um, Sure, there's complexities involved, but in terms of cost, c cities and towns build schools, they build roads, they build water systems that compared to a broadband network, the, in, in terms of relative cost, broadband networks are a drop in the bucket compared to the cost associated with some of those type of capital projects that cities undertake all the time. Te modern telecommunications has become so important, not only from an equity standpoint of view, but even from an economic development point standpoint of view. You've got businesses who are making decisions on whether they'll stay or relocate based on telecommunication infrastructure in, in, in locations. You've got people making decisions about where they're going to move to, individuals, where they're going to move to based on what kind of internet service is available. Um, and so 
in the state of Massachusetts right now, you've got a whole number of uh, 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 various communities who have got fed up with the monopoly situation and are at various planning stages, Falmouth being one, um, where they've established these municipal light plants first, um, MLP. Municipal light plant is uh, a state designation that allows a community to set up a telecommunication uh, utility. Um, and it, it, it has various other benefits. I don't think you actually need one to build a broadband network, but, but every community in the state that's done so. And there's about two dozen communities in Massachusetts that have already built fiber to the home networks. Most of them are in the Berkshires, which is where the state, going back to the Patrick administration, made some investments to make that possible. Where you've got um, folks that, are, that have better connectivity than anybody here in Boston or in the Boston area. And people say, well, you know, yeah, cities can do that. And, um, but, you know, Chattanooga, who's the golden child, who invested $220 million to build their fiber network, and according to a University of Tennessee independent study recently found that that city has reaped a $2.7 billion return on investment in its first 10 years of operation. You, you should look that up. But if you want to look for successful examples of cities who have built broadband networks without having an existing electric utility, because I know some folks think, yeah, cities can do it, but only the ones with electric utilities. Well, there's some examples out there. You've got Hillsborough, Oregon, where they've, built, where, they've, where they've started to build a broadband network where they have the ability where they can offer for income eligible households a, a symmetrical gig connection for 10 bucks a month. You've got Fairlawn, Ohio. You've got Far Texas. You've got Leverett, Massachusetts. And then if you go up to Vermont, EC Fiber, another example of a well-run, long-standing success story, 25 towns came together and figured it out. So certainly, Somerville's and Cambridge and Falmouth can certainly figure it out. It's more a question of will. And right now, we are in an unprecedented moment. Now, I realize that the city here put together a, a, a report that kind of looked at this in 2019. A lot has changed since 2019. The pandemic, obviously, has really shown people the importance of, connect, of having universal, u ubiquitous connectivity uh, and reliable connectivity. And also, here's the other thing that's changed. American Rescue Plan funds, the infrastructure bill. Massachusetts got $5 billion in, in, in rescue plan money. They only put $50 million aside for broadband and not to, for new network deployment, but for very important digital equity programs and digital planning. However, every state in the, in the country and every U.S. territory, including Massachusetts, has submitted, submitted their letter of intent to participate in the BEAD program, which was part of the infrastructure bill. This is a $65 billion program, $42 billion of it for network deployment. Every state in the United States is going to get $100 million just for broadband, then on top of that money based on the, like, the relative number of unserved and underserved locations. So if you look at Massachusetts, Massachusetts is probably going to get somewhere on the order of three, four hundred, maybe $500 million for broadband. Nice. So what communities now need to be doing in Massachusetts is speaking with their state lawmakers and really lobbying for the state to come up with a robust grant program for communities who are interested in building broadband networks, uh, e expanding broadband networks, and there's all manner of ways to do this. Our particular approach uh, is, is an alternative to the, to the failed market that we see with these private providers. It's the municipal broadband approach, and there's all kinds of ways of approaching that where a, a municipality builds, owns, and operates, or they partner with a private provider in what are called public-private partnerships, or they build open access networks and, and, and invite uh, private providers to come in and use that network to offer service. So there's all manner of ways in which this can be done. The bottom line is, is that, as, uh, as Josh Edmonds sa said, you can't coupon your way out of the digital divide. I'm not here to say what Somerville should or shouldn't do. It's, it's, but, but I do believe that now is the time for communities like Somerville to seriously consider, meaning think about a serious thorough assessment in, like that's involved with a, a, a real feasibility study to look at various models, to make recommendations, to really look and do a detailed market analysis. Um, okay. And um, yeah, that's, that's, that, that's, that's about it. Thank you. Well, uh, thank you, Sean.
Um, really glad that you got into the equity issues and to the uh, uh, prospect for getting serious financial assistance uh, that's in front of us. And uh, that's a good segue to our next panelist, Rabbi Yoni from Cambridge, who has been with a group called Upgrade Cambridge that is further along in the process of exploring municipal broadband feasibility in our uh, neighboring town. And hopefully there's some lessons there that we could uh, emulate here in Somerville. Rabbi Yoni? Uh, thank you. Um, so housing is a human right. I'm on page one of my presentation. Um, and I believe that freedom of broadband provider choice by a tenant is also a human right, that we should allow each person in a multi-tenant environment, each tenant, to choose which broadband provider they want. Um, as the previous speaker noted, in many cases, for example, in the building where I live, there is exactly one broadband provider that the management allows us to use. And even though we could, I was able to find another one, they said, no, we're getting paid by that broadband provider for us to restrict your choice. Um, so it would be contrary to that to allow you to use anyone else. Um, I'm on the board of directors of and steering committee of broadband of Upgrade Cambridge, which uh, is now a 501c3. Uh, next page of the introduction. Um, so why do we need broadband? Why is it so critical? Um, it's essential, particularly in the pandemic era and post-pandemic era, for distance learning, people who want to be in school, whether it's this, a physical school that is learning from afar or just separate learning from afar, uh, medical care, whether it's uh, diagnosis, whether it's psychological care, these are things that are really having reliable broadband is, is essential. Um, community engagement, people uh, participate religiously and communally, but need broadband to do it, and particularly upload speeds and uh, static IP to be able to do that. And of course, people who wish to do remote work, um, it, it's really challenging to do remote work if your broadband connection is unreliable or the customer service is not good. Um, and, and was pointed out, the federal government feels it's so important that high quality broadband is free um, to, as the previous speaker noted, about 13 uh, million people. Um, and that's a statement of how important this issue is. Uh, next page, uh, statement of problem. The question is, well, why is free broadband not enough? Um, well, clearly, one of the issues is it's free for a little while. Uh, and another issue uh, is that the residents are not allowed to choose their own broadband provider. So for example, if I wanted a um, 200 down, 100 up speed, which I could have gotten through the federal government for free, uh, my landlord simply said, well, no, you can't have it. Then uh, they said, because Comcast is paying us to limit your choice. And that there are the exclusive agreements where Comcast pays a portion of each bill, I'd estimate probably about 10% um, for each um, tenant to the landlord, so the landlord will not allow anyone else in there. And even though the, bill, the agreements are quote, marketing agreements. The landlord interprets them as exclusive agreements. Uh, next page, uh, review of legal situation. So has anyone dealt with this issue? In fact, the federal government in FCC ruling um, 2212 of February 15th allows ex uh, outlaws exclusive agreements that de facto res restricts resident choice of internet provider. And they say so in black and white that you can't do this. Um, and so I complained to the FCC uh, before the ruling last December and January. Then the ruling came out, said, OK, uh, wait a few months. So uh, in June, I refreshed my um, request. Uh, Comcast wrote back and said, no, uh, that's, we're not going to do it. Um, the landlord then retaliated against me. Um, three days later, and I then uh, kept the process going, and now I still have a pending uh, complaint with the FCC. It got a, yet a new ticket number. But 
there isn't enforcement on the FCC side or state or local level. And that's why I'm here to get people to be aware that we need this legal situation to change and to have more enforcement. Um, next page, a hypothesis. So uh, here are some brainstorm suggestions for um, my local representative, who I voted for not just a few days ago, uh, and uh, that we need to enshrine the FCC 2212 into Massachusetts general law and to provide local enforcement for it, because the FCC is great, but they're far away, and um, at least in my experience, they haven't actually done enforcement. Um, I've also complained to the Massachusetts Attorney General's office, and they've referred it for mediation to the city of Cambridge, uh, but all they could do is to facilitate the dialogue. Um, we should, in terms of mass general laws, we should prohibit payments from, to ban Comcast from bribe and other ISPs from bribing landlords, especially in inclusionary subsidized housing. Um, there's no issue there of interference in market rate uh, because already anyone who's opted into inclusionary subsidized housing, they have already agreed that they're going to provide this good for this price and the landlords are getting paid above what they're allowed to, whether by city law or by federal law. And we just need a state, Massachusetts general law, to make sure that this is actually being enforced. Uh, because those other laws don't have a clear enforcement mechanism on the books at the moment. Okay, try to wrap up. Uh, okay. Um, and in terms of uh, affirmative action that I think that the uh, we, sh we have this place where basically the inclusionary housing and multiple tenant environment tenants are all blocked from uh, being able to choose their broadband provider. And so we need to make sure that the l landlords actually are mandated to provide a choice. If there's a choice available in the city, that the broadband provider be allowed to be a choice available to the tenant in each multi-tenant environment. Uh, thank you for your attention. Thank you, Rabbi Yoni. And uh, <clears throat> hopefully the uh, city of Somerville can learn from uh, some of your experience in Cambridge. And speaking of what we can learn from, our next panelist is James O'Keefe, who was a co-author and member of the city's internet task force uh, report, which was written in 2019. 19, that's when it came and, out, yeah. yeah, and so uh, uh, you know, this isn't the city's first uh, kind of look at the feasibility of this. But uh, as uh, Rabbi Yoni pointed out, and as Sean pointed out, uh, a lot has changed. But uh, James, oh, uh, kind of update us on what happened in 2019. What were the findings of the report? and perhaps uh, your own perspective on which way we might be able to move forward uh, here in Somerville now. <clears throat> Thank you very much, Rand. Thank you both for participating. Thank you all in the audience. Uh, my name is James O'Keefe, just as a bit of introduction. Um, I am captain of the Massachusetts Pirate Party. And back when the Trump uh, Federal Communications Commission decided to gut net neutrality, I organized a bunch of activists to form massmesh.org to bring, to bring community internet access, uh, generally wireless, uh, to uh, Massachusetts. And over time, the dedicated activists and programmers have come up with a set of software that you can use to go and provide access and to also encrypt it so that your ISP is not spying on you, which we know the FCC allowed as well. <clears throat> Since then, I've been working with uh, MeshBoston.net to actually take this software, take this commodity hardware, and be able to roll that out. We have some access points in Somerville. We have access points in uh, Belmont, in Salem. And so we are looking for volunteers uh, who are willing to help us with that. But to your point, uh, back in 2019, uh, I was part of the process of coming up with uh, a plan for Somerville as part of the Internet Task Force. Now, Somerville, as you may or may not know, is one of the few cities in the Commonwealth that has competition for most of this city. 
Uh, we have generally Comcast. We have RCN, now uh, Astound, I believe. And um, I believe some parts might even have Verizon Fios. Uh, but even with that, we still pay some of the most expensive costs, uh, certainly worldwide and, and even in some cases in the US. So we set forth the objective of looking at the problem, which is how do we provide access to everyone? How do we provide true net neutrality? How do we enforce these mechanisms? And how do we bring greater competition? Somerville led the way by having competition, uh, as I said, between two or three providers. But Somerville can still lead the way. And the report itself is rather long. It goes through a lot of different options, listing the pros and cons. But we do have some recommendations. Uh, one is to encourage uh, a competitive marketplace over fiber optics to have to partner with or sponsor ourselves a fiber optic network that will hopefully not go over the many ubiquitous uh, light posts and um, and <clears throat> various uh, art, various uh, former trees that litter our city. Uh, but instead go and put a fiber network underground, either through trenching that can be done through, under the road surface, um, and then to provide either from, the, from, the, from Somerville or through our partner to create a public or a private utility that would then allow internet service providers to have access to uh, that fiber network so that we're not tied into Comcast, we're not tied into RCN. If some folks locally want to start their own Somerville ISP or like uh, MeshBoston.net uh, does, if we wanted to do that, then we would be able to use that network and to pay a reasonable cost for access to that. Um, <clears throat> from setting that up, that would allow competition, as I noted. It would get things out of, uh, out of our line of sight and would bring Somerville into the 21st century. We, if, you, if you go to Comcast or you go to RCN, they'll offer you a gigabit network, but it's not a gigabit network. And it certainly isn't symmetrical. That means your upload speeds are significantly less than your download speeds. It's still tied into that cable mentality of content is your movies are served to you, not you want to be able to connect with other people or you want to start an internet service out of your home. That's not really possible. And so having a fiber optic network, one that anyone can use would provide that and would reap benefits for Somerville. Uh, we do, we aren't like other states. Other states, uh, Comcast, the other providers have gone in and they've legislated, that they've had the state legislature ban municipalities from creating their own internet service providers. That's not Massachusetts, thankfully. But we always have the potential problem of ISPs suing due to, com due to competitive practices. In other words, if they have a duopoly, it is wrong in their mindset to go and have a municipality go and create their own ISP. And that's certainly something that we need to challenge throughout the state. Um, other things in the report are continuing to encourage research in mesh networks, uh, signed in publicly wireless access networks, um, going and actually mapping out all of the conduits. This is something that Somerville can do now. It could pay someone to go and map where are all the manhole covers, where are all the access, where, where, where is all the infrastructure that is owned by Somerville or is owned by the various utilities so we know where everything is, and we can plan accordingly. It's frightening to think that that doesn't exist already. 
I, you know, as I walk through uh, bits of sidewalk that has slowly degraded, I don't understand why we don't know, oh, this company put that in. It looks like crap five years later. Let's not use them. Yeah. We could go and map that. We have the GIS, the geographic information systems to do that. <clears throat> so there are possibilities. The report covers them. Um, but one thing I just want to say, putting my pirate hat on, we've spent $200 billion from the federal government to subsidize Comcast, to subsidize various ISPs, and yet we don't have speeds of South Korea. We don't have costs of many other countries. It is possible to go and get better rates in Indonesia than it is in the United States. And so that money has just gone into stock buybacks and we need to be investing in our infrastructure in Somerville, in Massachusetts, that's going to meet the needs of the people here, not uh, Wall Street banksters. And I'll end on that. Very good note to wrap up on. Thank you very much, James. So uh, before we turn to the audience, I do want to uh, thank uh, the Somerville Media Center, Cat Powers, and the whole team here that's making this uh, live show possible. Uh, the Somerville Media Center is an incredible resource here in the community that allows this kind of thing to happen. And uh, we're really grateful to the work that y you all do. Um, uh, Veronica Wells, uh, and uh, I also want to mention John Shea, our uh, Facebook uh, remote operator from one of our co-sponsors, the Community Action Agency of Somerville. Um, other co-sponsors are the Union Square Neighborhood Association, the Somerville Municipal Employees Association, and Mass Senior Action Council, Somerville Cambridge Chapter, and the Racial Justice Collaborative. Um, so with those acknowledgments, I want to now uh, turn to uh, some of the respondents and members of our uh, audience that having listened to this and having uh, your own perspectives and views on the feasibility and prospects for municipal broadband in Somerville, uh, who's going to be the first to step up to the microphone and uh, give us a uh, response to the panelists and or your own views. Feel free. Who's next? Uh, perhaps Re Representative Conley. Sure, yeah. Should I stand up? Stand up, okay. come to the mic, and uh, okay. uh, welcome to uh, this forum on municipal broadband. Sure, yeah. Well, thank you for having me. Um, I always have to do this little awkward uh, readjustment. For That's the, why they uh, call you Big Mike. The six foot eight frame. Is my <laughs> audio working okay? Um, well, thank you for having me this morning. Thank you, Rand. Thank you to Somerville Stands Together. Um, I fully agree with really all of the panelists and everything that was said. Uh, you know, we know that uh, broadband access uh, should be a human right, as was suggested. And we've seen in so many different contexts this corporatization, the investor-owned utilities, how they have failed us, whether that is you know, a gas utility, an electric utility, uh, or a broadband utility. Uh, there were a few questions uh, that were sent to me prior to the thing, and I prepared a few answers. So just for the record, or, or anyone watching at home who uh, is curious, it's the Department of Telecommunications and Cable. Uh, they reside under the Executive Office of Housing and Economic Development. Uh, they have authority over this area. There are two legislative committees, uh, what we call the TUE Committee, uh, Telecommunications, Utilities, and Energy, as well as the Advanced Information Technology, Internet, and Cyber Security Committee. Those are the two legislative committees that have uh, jurisdiction on this topic. Uh, they heard uh, over 50 bills this session. Uh, there was some degree of success on some matters uh, this session, uh, but a lot of work uh, remains to be done. Uh, as was mentioned uh, by one of the speakers, uh, we did deploy about $50 million for broadband access uh, last session. Uh, these funds were intended to close the digital divide 
uh, by facilitating broadband access. Um, those funds were sent to something we call the Broadband Innovation Fund. Um, also last year, there was an effort by Comcast uh, to impose data caps, and so several legislators uh, signed letters, filed legislation. We pushed back on one of those data cap efforts, uh, but so much more remains to be done. I want to highlight a bill that I support. This is House Bill 141, an act removing barriers to internet regulation, competition, uh, and affordability. Uh, this would create a division of broadband uh, within the DTC and authorize them to regulate rate increases, speed, and access across the Commonwealth, and it would remove a section of law that limits the ability to regulate internet service providers. Um, there's also legislation to expand the authority of the Massachusetts School Building Authority to actually you know, put the charge with our school building authority that they have to take more responsibility around being proactive uh, around broadband access. And that's so important, uh, particularly to the extent there are times of remote learning. Um, finally, there's House Bill 4178, an act relative to assuring a jumpstart in investments uh, to establish a municipal broadband development fund. So um, sort of just wrapping up here with these comments, you know, as Sean mentioned, I totally agree we need a robust grant program. You know, so many issues we can talk about administration uh, or rearranging concepts. But so much comes back to public investment. You know, uh, I like the comments that you can't coupon your way out of this. We need to make a broad decision uh, to have public broadband as a utility, as a human right, in the same way that water flows through the streets. Um, and when you have a fire, uh, you call up the fire department and you expect them to come. This is just a basic necessity that government needs to be responsible for. Um, municipal broadband is so important. I've been a longtime supporter of Upgrade Cambridge, and I've seen the tension with previous city administrations in Cambridge where the residents and the advocates and the city councilors do all the work, and previous city managers have stalled and, and stonewalled. We have a great new city manager who has be just been sworn in, and so I'm very hopeful. He's, he's very progressive. I think he understands a lot of these issues. So I'm very hopeful with our new city manager. Um, the things that Upgrade Cambridge have been asking for will finally come to fruition, and that'll set a great example for Somerville. Um, I agree with James regarding you know, the inefficient nature of this government investment in corporate utilities, and that's why I'm proud to say I'm the lead sponsor of a legislation uh, called an act to facilitate public ownership of public utilities. I really worked on that title, <laughs> um, and the concept would be that we would put ourselves on a path to bring all of our utilities back within the public domain. And then finally, as a lifelong tenant and renter, uh, I want to agree with the rabbi, uh, housing is a human right, and tenants absolutely deserve to have real choices and real access. So. That's my spiel. I'm so psyched that you uh, invited me, and I want to continue to partner with you, so please reach out to my office. The new legislative session starts in January, and I hope we can make progress on this stuff. Thank you, Representative Conley. Thank you. And I guess if we're going to continue in the uh, uh, calling on our elected officials, uh, uh, Councilor Strezzo, uh, uh, please come up to the mic and uh, welcome to this municipal forum. Thank you. And um, it uh, sounds like there's a lot of potential here in Somerville. Thank you. Well, <laughs> I'm used to hearing more of a PA from a live band standpoint, so this is a, a different kind of mic for me. Um, first, I want uh, I want to make sure that no one in, that I, I'm going to try to keep this brief and let you know what's been happening in Somerville. Um, I want to uh, thanks for this platform because it allows us to really combine ideas of what we're doing, what, what can do we do, and uh, the future, which is extremely exciting to me. Um, and I want to really uh, thank you, Rep Connolly, for that information. I'm so excited to hear where we're going to go um, with your bill, and I would love to, to help support that. Now, when we talk municipally, 
Um, I'll tell you just a couple of things that I've been doing at a citywide level with Somerville to expand accessibility and also um, bringing forward some points and, and things that I've been, um, some barriers I've been facing, um, which, uh, as you've mentioned, has opened up some uh, possibilities. First off, I'll bring attention to the fact, um, just very basically, when it comes to the FCC resolution that did happen in February of this year, allowing us to have better options of our providers. The only way I've found possible, I wrote a resolution and, and, and called on my colleagues for support, but at this point, all I've seen possible is a public awareness campaign, and I really hope that we can do more to get the word out on our options with that uh, when we talk about housing and tenant rights of the availability of that. N and when we talk about um, a lot of issues that I've been trying to face when we talk about infrastructure are the wires. And I currently, I in the spring, uh, maybe earlier, I've been trying to tackle loose wires and infrastructure issues and what cable companies and uh, what they own here in our city and lack of maintenance and also um, how it affects us as a community. And I put forward an ordina ordinance amendment that is currently in legislative matters, hopefully will be on the agenda soon. But I put forward an ordinance amendment because where we lie currently with infrastructure, uh, the superintendent, uh, the city superintendent of highways is in charge of that. And we have the ability within the city to fine our, uh, our companies for not taking care of their wires, for not maintaining it but it's a matter of proving who owns those wires. And so it was very exciting to hear that we could hire someone to do that because it is also a complex situation on my end. Do I, can, do I have the capacity or does the city have the capacity to make uh, DPW take on one more task of identifying each pole that exists? Um, that's, so that's, uh, so I'm, I'm very excited about following up that conversation. Um, also, at a municipal level, one of the ways I've been trying to address accessibility and uh, within our community is for our affordable housing units, like uh, our housing authority, to open up free Wi-Fi. We've talked about this in committee, and I've been pushing it hard for that, our housing authorities to, to at least, very minimally, create common space areas of free Wi-Fi inter internet accessibility. To this, yet, to this point, and, and we, uh, we have not had that, um, and our residents need that. And it's the concept of inclusionary zone, uh, inclusionary units versus affordable housing units uh, that, are, that are housing authority or, yeah, I'm gonna go on. Uh, how, don't, how do we make that possible? I am really hoping that we can continue on this dialogue perhaps at the end of the year and have another forum, but there's a lot of action that we can do at a municipal level, and just having a continued dialogue mm -hmm. and what the strengths each of us bring, we can really do a lot, and I'm so excited what we can do from here into the next six months. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Stresso. And <coughs> I think what I'm hearing there is that uh, this kind of conversation might be welcome in the, in the chambers of the City Council and hopefully with the Mayor. It's been happening. It's been happening, and it needs to continue to happen. Um, so uh, who's going to step up next? Uh, uh, Charlie Tesh or uh, Diane Wong or who? Uh, I'm sorry, Greg Hill, our convener. Uh, Greg Hill, uh, I'm a, whoops, is it rolling, Bob? You're, you know you're on. That's from. <laughs> um, I'm Greg Hill, uh, one of the forum organizers. Um, I have to say we are, uh, we regret that we have not included more uh, women panelists. Um, we're covered with Rue, and uh, going forward, we want to make sure that, um, you know, this isn't the end of the uh, of the struggle for municipal broadband. This is the beginning, and we, I'm gonna, we're going to make damn sure that there are more women included. Not that we didn't invite them. But um, you know, we uh, we're all about equity, and we're going to. Uh, I think we're going to, you know, we're going to put our our deeds into in our words into deeds. Um, I do have a question for Sean um, and the other panelists. Um, what are the we we need to get a a municipal light plant going in Somerville, and also how do, how do, how do we get that to happen? And also. Um, what are the hallmarks of a good 
RF uh, feasibility study and to what extent is that going along in Cambridge? And Rabbi, what are the hallmarks of the uh, feasibility study in, in uh, Cambridge? Thank you. Okay, that's a good cue to uh, Sean. All right. Um, and then Rabbi Ioni. Right, so, so I mean, a, f a few things that I, I would imagine Somerville would want to consider for those who are seriously interested in municipal broadband, you brought up a few. So, so essentially, most communities that get into municipal broadband, there's a, obviously a planning process, or, um, and the effort is almost always driven by a handful of local champions working in concert with elected officials within, particularly the city council uh, or the mayor's office, that kind of thing. And, you know, there's a couple of different tr sort of simultaneous tracks. And I think one milestone for a community like Somerville would, would be to have the city commission a, what is called a feasibility study. Not particularly keen on the word feasibility study because of course it's feasible. <laughs> But it's just a sort of a generic term that's used in the industry. And by that, it's a thorough, and Falmouth, Falmouth Net's feasibility study is a great model. It's a very thorough, it's about 279 pages long. And what it involves is all the stuff that we've talked about here, which is, which is mapping the community assets, analyzing the whole right-of-way utility pole issue, um, doing a real market analysis about what is actually available what are the prices? What are real speeds? Uh, it, it involves doing a community survey. It involves give, getting a sense of what are the likely uh, take rates that 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 the city that uh, the city might get with, by building a municipal network. It analyzes various, not just potential models of how you could do this, but the finance, but but tied to the 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 how that that could be financed, and. Um, and you know how long it would take to, you know to pay off or uh and when the, the city might expect to you know to break even these kind of things so so that's one thing that can be done me in the meanwhile and it, it, the, the, there's no necessarily has to go by a particular order also it's very advantageous in uh, the commonwealth to establish an mlp a municipal light plan and that you can look up you know, at the, uh, on, on the state website, but a, a municipal light plant allows a community to establish a telecommu telecommunications utility. And there's various advantages to, 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 to doing that. Um, and so by putting th things like th those mechanisms in place, all the while having a very robust public education campaign, because there's a lot to sort through and there's a lot to explain. People, you know, and this isn't, you know, people aren't, you know, don't fall out of bed or, or, or fall out of the womb knowing, you know, the difference between a fiber network, um, you know, uh, uh, HFC networks or DSL and what all that stuff means and what the implications of that are. Um, and so you're going to want to have people in the community have a, a basic grasp of, of, of what's out there, what's possible, and to be able to answer some questions as well as whenever a city the size of Somerville starts to get serious about municipal broadband, you can expect there to be pushback from the incumbents because they see municipal broadband as being an existential threat. And so that's when they start to trot out the same old tired examples of, oh, of the same two or three municipal broadband failures and, and want people to not know that there's you know, over 900 of these in existence. Um, and so that to me feels like where Somerville uh, can be thinking about. And of course, shameless plug for our institute, we've just unveiled two new programs that are designed specifically for cities and communities that really want to dig in and get the details on what the digital landscape is and all of the things that you need to know and consider in order to move forward um, with any type of municipal broadband project. Thank you, Sean. I'm being given a high sign that we need to wrap up and that we only have how many minutes left? 90 seconds. 90 oh. seconds left. <laughs> um, so mm -hmm. I, I think, uh, uh, Rabbi Yoni, do you have a 30 second comment? And then I'm going to close it. Um, sure. In my, uh, on slide nine uh, of my previous handout, uh, that I, I definitely support the, um, the big tent approach of the honorable representative here. And 
I believe that we need to work mostly on the state level to change the laws because the state is sovereign. Um, things such as net neutrality, uh, very appreciative for the banning the data caps. It may be that Massachusetts was the only one who escaped the data cap. So thank you, very great okay, work there. Thank you very much, Rabbi Dr. Yoni. Um, so with that, we're gonna close this program out. I invite everybody, of course, to stick around afterwards for some pizza and uh, refreshments. Um, again, this has been put on by Somerville Stands Together. Uh, visit our website at somervillestandstogether.com and sign up there. Our next meeting of the coalition is October 17th at 4.30. Uh, we meet monthly. If you want to be involved in winning municipal broadband for the city of Somerville, please get in touch with us uh, and or reach out to any of our panelists or to uh, the stalwart Greg Hill. Again, thank you to the Somerville, Municip uh, Somerville Media Center. And with that, uh, we're going to end our live show. Thank you, everybody.